Hi, and welcome to our live discussion and Q&A on the new AHA, ACC, HFSA heart failure guidelines. I'm Mark Drasm, the Clinical Chief of Cardiology at UT Southwestern and the current president of the HFSA. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today with uh, seminal guests who really were instrumental in both developing and also publishing the new heart failure guidelines. Um, we'll start off and just go around with our esteemed panelists so everyone will uh, connect their voices. And we'll start with uh, Paul. Oh, I'm Paul Heidenreich, I'm cardiologist from Stanford University, Palo Alto VA, and I was the chair of the writing committee. Thank you, and Beacom. Hi, I'm Beacom Boskert, professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and I was the vice chair of the guidelines committee. And Orly. Hi, I'm Orly Vardani, and I'm an associate professor of medicine at University of Minnesota and at the Minneapolis VA, and I was a member of the writing committee. Uh, and Rob. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Rob Mentz, heart failure cardiologist at Duke and the editor-in-chief of the journal Cardiac Failure. And Anu. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Anu Lala. I'm a heart failure cardiologist at Mount Sinai in New York and deputy editor of the journal Cardiac Failure. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here today. You can see we really have assembled a fantastic panel. And I want to thank all of you as well who are listening out there. We're streaming this live on HFSA's Twitter and YouTube channels today. And a recording of the discussion will be available on the HFSA website um, after we finish. Um, I also want to remind you there'll be a Q&A at the end of this uh, broadcast. So uh, send in your questions. You can tweet them or, or DM them to HFSA on Twitter. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. So with that as background, let's just jump right in here. And I first thought it'd be interesting for our viewers to kind of get a little uh, look behind the scenes and hear what about the overall uh, process of developing the guidelines from from the chair and the vice chair. Um, how long does it take, the key steps? Just kind of give us a little glimpse of what goes on behind uh, the scenes of making this important document. Thank you, uh, Mark. So I'll, I'll begin, I'll let Vika then give her comments. Um, so we often start several years in advance because one needs to both identify the writing committee, uh, make sure that that's balanced, um, make sure that um, we follow all the ACC, AHA, and HFSA if they're a partner, um, having all of their requirements for limiting conflicts of interest. So just putting the writing group together takes a fair amount of time. After that, there's a review of the literature um, and then frequent meetings among the group over the course of a year, a year and a half, typically weekly, uh, to discuss all the different areas uh, within cardiology. And then there's a prolonged period of uh, peer review and revision uh, before it finally then um, goes for publication. Um, Beacom, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to give you your thoughts and um, sort of experience with the guideline. Thank you, Paul. There is a very structured process uh, in addition to the management of the potential a conflict or a assortment of lack of conflict. Uh, the writing committee has to have a more than 51% of its members not having any conflict. Um, and uh, relevant literature search um, along with clinical trials, research studies that are published to date are reviewed um, and they inform the recommendations. And the recommendations are formulated with a consensus development among the, the writing committee members. The writing committee has a representation from a variety of different specialists, ranging from heart failure specialists, cardiologists, internists, interventionalists, electrophysiologists, uh, surgeons, pharmacists, advanced nurse practitioners, as well as patient representatives. And um, in this uh, guideline, we had representation from American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and Heart Failure Society of America. Well, thank you both. I think I think our readers will find that very interesting. And then, Orly, I know you were on the uh, writing committee. What, what was it from your perspective as uh, we were led by uh, Paul and Beacon so capably? Um, I also had um, the, the experience that it was a very structured process, very organized, but also really collaborative. So the weekly meetings helped to um, have uh, individual topics discussed during those meetings, and then everyone could way in. Um, the, the voting process was very structured. Um, and so all in all, I, I felt like it was a, a great group to work with over this year, year and a half of, of writing, 
with plenty of opportunity for everyone to provide input. So I thought from that standpoint, it was very well done. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Robin, I knew I imagine this uh, kind of is reminiscent of what's going on in terminal cardiac failure currently. Yeah, I think that's right. I, you know, the group has nicely highlighted the collaborative process between the different societies, in this case, ACC, AHA, and HFSA, and then the coordination across the journals. So really bringing together uh, tremendous expertise to have a coordinated effort uh, to disseminate these information and keeping in line with embargoes. Uh, we were very fortunate in this case that it coincided nicely with the ACC. So getting together for, for many of us the first time since the HFSA meeting, getting together, having this document come out, importantly having a number of different platforms, everything from the sessions to passing someone in the hallway and having a discussion around this. And for our journal, it was really exciting to, to be part of that effort and to think that people take in information differently uh, so launching YouTube videos to coincide and share insights about the important work that this guideline writing committee uh, has carried out over, over this time period. But Anu, what would you add? Thanks, Rob. I think it was it's just it was so exciting to be at ACC, as you mentioned, and see so many of you guys on the panel in person. I think it was particularly kind of moving almost feels like the forgotten child, you know, and so to see that room completely packed when the when the guidelines and Beacon and Paul were presenting them, uh, it was just, it's really overwhelming. It feels so exciting to see how far we have come as a field and to see our community come up collectively and be excited about it collectively was a really exciting process. And obviously, from, from all different aspects, from the presentations at ACC to the joint publication across our heart failure uh, journals, and then the excitement generated in our community. I think it's been, at least I've been really, really excited about them. I think it's such a huge service to our community. Um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful to the, to the writing committee. Yeah, there, there, there definitely was a buzz at ECC in that not only was the room packed, but the overflow room was packed as, as they were being presented. It was really, really exciting. I agree. Let's, let's jump in now and, and, and start to talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, actual parts of the guideline. Um, the first aspect is, is how we actually define the various stages. Of course, we've had stages A, B, C, and D for, for quite a long time. But uh, in the guidelines, we've kind of made some uh, uh, changes and this specific around A and B. So maybe you can catch the readers up, Beacon, maybe you'll, you'll jump in here. Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, why did we do this? Um, the stages A, B, C, D were understood by the specialists, but well, it was not widely adopted by the non-specialists and not well understood by the patients, like they understand pre-cancer. So we thought that we needed to change the terminologies for them to be better understood by patients and non-specialists. The second reason was the um, evolving field now entails ability to identify higher risk by other um, entities such as biomarkers beyond imaging and or EF quantification. It was critical for us to embrace that though we had embedded the class 2A recommendation for biomarker screening back in 2017, it was not happening in practice. So it was clear that people were not aware that uh, these biomarkers could identify a higher risk, um, especially if, when screened, um, when they had the cardiovascular risk factors. And the third important reason for this was uh, we now have treatment that is very specific for um, heart failure at risk and pre-heart failure that can truly prevent heart failure. And if I may uh, summarize these stages, uh, former stage A, which is defined as at risk for heart failure are for patients without current symptoms and or signs, without structural, functional, or biomarker abnormality. Uh, the second stage is now called pre-heart failure for former stage B, for individuals without current symptoms and or signs, but either with structural or functional or biomarker abnormality as elevated natriuretic peptide levels or abnormal cardiac uh, troponin in the setting of exposure to cardiotoxins, and simple heart failure for former stage C, and advanced heart failure for uh, former stage D. And final comment, it also is critical for it not to give the impression that the stages only went from 
A towards D, meaning a almost a um, rule that they only um, advance in one direction. Um, this uh, nomenclature now allows us to state that one can actually prevent heart failure and also one can improve and an advanced heart failure patient can become just a heart failure patient. So there is a possibility to reverse the process and one can go backwards and improve. And, and certainly the emphasis on prevention is, is key is a huge message uh, by these changes in nomenclature. Let me, let me jump to the other aspect you mentioned in a kind of trajectory of heart failure improvement, things like that. And I know we uh, uh, incorporated a new, new criteria for ejection fraction changes. So maybe Paul, you can kind of catch the audience up on, on that change. So regarding our classification by ejection fraction, you know, we now classify it into four categories. Um, one is reduced uh, less than or equal to 40% for the ejection fraction. Um, if you are reduced and then improved to above 40% later, we would call you improved ejection fraction. And we distinguish that from the other two groups, the 41 to 49%, which is mildly reduced, and the preserved ejection fraction, which is an EF greater than 50%, because all four have slightly different uh, treatments. If you're improved, we're going to recommend, we recommend that you continue on uh, the patient's uh, medications for which uh, they were treated on when their ejection fraction was low, um, which would be different from if someone first presented with, say, mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction. Yeah, and certainly, you know, far too common still see uh, patients who have recovered and or improved and uh, someone stops the medications, uh, which uh, is really unfortunate. So yeah. hopefully this will, will help in that regard. I agree. And I think patients themselves, while it's good that they're learning about the ejection fraction when they, you know, they may feel that, oh, well, now my, my number is better. Therefore, that means I can stop medication. Um, so we, we wanted to make this also known to the patients, yes, while you are improved, we still need to continue treatment. Yeah, and hopefully all, any patient out there listening, uh, make sure you don't stop your medications without talking to your heart failure cardiologist. Um, probably the, in terms of the treatment, uh, probably uh, the, the area that's come up, at least in my conversations most commonly with people about the guidelines is, is the incorporation of SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, maybe Orly, we'll, we'll have you jump in and, and talk about this idea of going from triple to quadruple therapy, uh, you know, why that was done and, and thoughts around that. Sure. So for patients with um, symptomatic heart failure, so what is now uh, stage C, there are a number of large randomized clinical trials of two different SGLT2 inhibitors, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin both of which showed significant improvement in clinical outcomes of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. So as a result of that, for actually we can go across the stages. Uh, I'll start with stage C for symptomatic patients. We have added this fourth class of drugs. So now we are not only on an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, a beta blocker, corticoid receptor antagonist, and now an SGLT2 inhibitor. This has also been added, or this class of drugs has also been added for stage A and stage B. Um, so the, the use is, is wide uh, reaching and inclusive of uh, patients with uh, mildly reduced ejection fraction and even those with preserved ejection fraction. Yeah, really, when you look at the totality of that evidence, it's, it's kind of breathtaking across the spectrum of heart failure, um, these, these compounds, how effective they've been, and, and uh, highest level recommendation C and, and two A's in the mildly reduced uh, and preserved ejection fraction. Um, you know, one of the air issues, uh, as, as I think Rob touched on this earlier about the implementation, um, you know, these, these compounds were designed, as everyone knows, uh, to treat diabetes. Um, and I kind of want to hear thoughts around from JCF and just, just everyone, um, how are we going to roll this out to the community? Is there going to be, what I'm worried about, is there going to be hesitation because cardiologists may be, not view this as their purview, or it's going to be the endocrinologist or the internist, or that's a diabetic drug, as opposed to a cardiac uh, medication. So maybe I'll start with a, a, a new Rob about from the JCF in terms of how are we going to disseminate this, uh, this new important information? 
Sure, thanks so much. So maybe a couple comments and then Anu jump in. Now, we felt very passionate that we wanted to include the multidisciplinary team that really represents the HFSA and represents heart failure care. So we brought together our, our associate editor team, patient representatives, uh, and distilled this really important document and then wanted to be able to disseminate that. So realizing that, that some pathways through YouTube videos, putting together slide sets that can be shared broadly, really trying to distill these important messages and then have perspective pieces and things that will in addition come out down the line to convey this to different audiences. So while such work has been done to get us to this point where we share the document, I think what you're really highlighting is that now we're moving into this next really important implementation phase and realizing this is a lot of new information, such incredible data have come out from these trials as Orly nicely went through. And now we need to distill this down and make sure that everyone understands this, this part of the care team. So for us, it's been really nice to be able to share a pharmacist perspective, a patient perspective, uh, and really to, to share this broadly so that we can best improve our patients' outcomes. If Anu, would you like to add in? Sure, I, I can tag on. I think, um, you know, one of the things actually Beacom has taught me since I was a fellow, and I think the guidelines really, really emphasize and highlight is this idea of how much language matters, right? It doesn't just matter only to our patients, which is the most important, but it also matters about how we communicate amongst ourselves in terms of clinicians, the referring cardiologists, the primary care physicians. So having things, stages, you know, it's so hard to be, have previously said, hey, you have heart failure, but doc, I have no symptoms. And then the, the, the referring clinician also is like, really, this patient doesn't really have heart failure. Like, why are you putting them on these meds? And so I think what I, I really love, and this started with the, universal def, the new universal definition of heart failure um, published in JCF earlier last year, and then now really put forth so, so well in this this new guideline is this emphasis on how much language matters. So I think that to me is really, really helpful. I love that we have more specific terms to talk about improvement in EF. And as Paul mentioned, okay, the EF has improved, but you're not done with this. This isn't a one and done and you're not taking your meds anymore, but no, we still need to do this. And in the new universal definition of heart failure, we call that heart failure with remission when symptoms had been um, put at bay with the use of guideline-directed medical therapy. But I think, Mark, what you're getting at is how do we put this into practice, right? Like the often quoted statistic is it takes over 15 years to have these guidelines be actually actualized or realized in clinical practice. So what do we do there? And I think along those lines of what how language matters, we also need to talk about what are the barriers to care? What are the barriers? You know, we use these words and, and Rob and I have written about this in the journal, and uh, many people in our community have, but we say, oh, this patient's non-compliant, or this patient you know, is non-adherent, or not on this medicine, but we don't really get into the why. Why is this patient not on this med? Can they afford it, right? Um, have they been educated uh, sufficiently? And so I think uh, the next step for us as a community to really realize these guidelines is to focus on the barriers and try and fill them and try and address them as best as we can so that we can really allow for our patients to enjoy better survival and then better quality of life. Yeah, if that's I, great. I'm sorry, go ahead. If I may add to Anu's very uh, uh, you know, clear points is the following. I think all the clinicians and patients right now should be ready to embrace multiple medication therapy to treat and hopefully cure heart failure. Very similar to what cancer did, we don't fear the number of medications in cancer. So the concepts that we try to emphasize in this document is persistent active symptoms require optimization. So we're not gonna stop at two medications. Quadruple therapy is the core therapy, regardless of how stable the patient looks. Even though the patient may look stable with two or three medications, we still recommend to optimize, including all four classes of medications. So from the patient's perspective, when the clinicians are communicating to the patients, they need to be able to message, this is going to make you live longer, but not only live longer, it's the, these medications improve quality of life. They actually help with reverse remodeling, thus they may not need um, 
defibrillator devices or other um, invasive procedures. Thus, the merits are not just survival benefit. They will uh, result in less hospitalizations, improve the LV function and quality of life. So I think it's critical for us now to embrace this optimization regardless of how the stable how stable the patient looks and use terminologies like persistent heart failure rather than stable heart failure. And I think that is important for all our patients and clinicians. Yeah, that's great. It's such a complicated, this therapeutic inertia is such a complicated multifactorial process undoubtedly. And, um, and I agree with you, the, I, I, in one of my presidential messages a couple of months ago, I talked about class two patients with mild symptoms, how that group may be, you know, it's not uh, someone crashing and burning, but they pose very different challenges because you get lulled into this false sense of security. Um, and you really have to stay on your game to make sure that you are uptitrating everything. And Paul, you know, you've spent uh, over two years, you, you know, nicely outlined the process as, as the chair, all this work. And, um, what are your thoughts? I mean, I know as a chair, you, you bring this forward, this incredible document. The last thing we want is it not to be implemented. Um, what are your thoughts around this about how, how high yield ways to, to get this into action? Yeah, well, I'm a firm believer in we taking a systems approach wherever we can and um, that we, and I think most of us have stopped thinking of this as one provider dealing with one patient. There routinely now is a team involved and often a system behind you. Depending on which uh, the, the infrastructure you have, I think having those team members, whether that be a nurse practitioner, a PA, a pharmacist, can take on a lot of this uh, uh, initiation and titration under the physician's guidance. Um, I think by having those people work to the top of their ability, um, I think we can achieve a lot more. And at the same time, using our um, data, such as dashboards, so that we can easily find patients who are not on optimal medical therapy, um, rather than, again, relying on an individual provider to check every time themselves. So we should have that data available to our, our teams. Yeah, it is interesting how little transparency there are there is about GDMT therapy, uh, how well people do with that. Um, early, uh, the team-based approach, uh, I'm sure that, that resonates with you. Are, are any final thoughts on the implementation? Yes, so um, absolutely. As a pharmacist, I am inherently biased about a team-based approach, but we we know that it it works if we do work as a team and each of us focuses on what we were trained to do. And as a pharmacist, I was trained to optimize uh, medications. And so I think in collaboration with my, my colleagues, that's really the best way to ensure that, that um, moment, we keep the momentum of starting the medicines um, and in addition, titrating them to where um, they're recommended based on clinical trial data. Yeah, that, that's great. And as I, I've described, the nurse practitioner I've worked with for, for almost two decades, she's a GDMT whisperer. <laughs> and uh, that, that, those are key people on the team for sure. Let's, let's move on to a, a hot topic at ACC was cardiogenic shock. Um, lots of sessions, lots of attendance there. Uh, we, in the guidelines, uh, there's a 2A recommendation regarding multidisciplinary team as being reasonable, and then a 2B for pulmonary artery catheter. I thought the, our listeners may be interested in those um, recommendations. Uh, Beacom, you want to you weigh in on, on how the group got there and, and thoughts around those? So there are many important trends happening in practice. Our ICUs actually have uh, more heart failure patients than ever. Um, the uh, historical um, composition of the ICUs have changed. Uh, in the past, we used to have acute coronary syndrome. Now it's mainly shock mainly um, mechanical circuitry support and um, this overlap of heart failure, advanced heart failure with shock management. Uh, with those in mind, um, and also with the evolving data. So the multidisciplinary experience has been validated by a variety of studies um, uh, demonstrating that if done in a coordinated manner, the outcomes are be better. And uh, also with, um, you know, for ability to identify the right management strategies, because it could entail mechanical circuits or support and or revascularization strategies, as well as further diagnostic measures. And um, 
also a consideration uh, for a PA catheter, especially when the hemodynamic status is uncertain. Uh, that actually can help with management strategies. We have a 2B recommendation for that. When one has the time, I, we are aware of the data that um, currently is evolving. Sometimes uh, shock is so imminent in the crashing and burning patient, there may not be time even for a uh, PA catheter. But currently we do see that if one is uncertain and or if it would help define the right uh, management strategies, uh, the um, PA, cath uh, PA line may be considered. And um, we have actually another to be recommendations for those who are um, not responding. So this delta change of response to therapy is also becoming very important. And that's also been incorporated in sky reclassification with the gradients. If what you're doing is not resulting in the appropriate response to therapy, then escalating either triage to a, another center that is able to provide um, advanced therapies such as mechanical circuitry support may be considered to optimize management. I think this is an evolving field where we're going to find more information like MI care did, but I think we're embracing all these. And I think it's critical for heart failure. Um, as I mentioned, it's a continuum of care in a multidisciplinary manner. And, and what do you think will take to move it up above a 2B recommendation to transfer to a shock center? I think, um, um, I'm so sorry, I thought it was uh, addressed to me, but I think you called it out onto Anu. But I'll just say that maybe more data, but I'll then call out for Anu. No, Thank you. Uh, Anu, you want to jump in? No, I, I, I didn't mean to do that. I was actually really interested in that answer myself. You know, I have to be honest. Um, I am a big proponent of using PA catheters, but I recognize that the environment in which I practice in New York is different than other parts of the country. And so I was interested actually in hearing, so I'm glad you took it because, <laughs> because I, I really, um, I think, and then Mark, you asked the right question. It's like, well, what do we need to show this? And, and you know, recognizing the challenges that there are in conducting clinical trials in cardiogenic shock. And now we have the cardiogenic shock working group. We've got the sky stages and we're, we're moving, you know, slowly. Um, but, but that to me was um, sort of interesting to see, but I recognize the importance of having, I mean, the guidelines are there to show what evidence we have and accordingly, you know, give a level of recommendation accordingly. But, you know, I have to say that that was the one thing that I said, okay, Huh, that's interesting because maybe, you know, I wouldn't have necessarily thought that because it's something I advocate for in the management of my shock patients. And uh, from the JCF perspective, because, you know, cardiogenic shock is this hot topic. It's an unmet need, high, high mortality rates, unfortunately, even, even with recent advances. Uh, anything coming from JCF around cardiogenic shock? Or yeah, you want to so highlight what you've done? So thanks so much for that, Mark. Um, I would definitely thank our um, guest editor team uh, in addition to Shashank Sinha, who actually led, that was our focus issue, was at this nexus of critical care cardiology. And as we look across the cardiovascular journals now, I think ours has also really taken a stand of wanting to um, receive these high impact articles and then to be able to share them with their audience of what's our best understanding of critical care cardiology, the role of the heart failure cardiologist, the shock team, and really disseminating uh, the insights from the evolving networks, as well as working groups that have really advanced our, our thoughts and approaches to cardiogenic shock very significantly, as you're noting, within recent years. Yeah, that, that's excellent. Let's, let's move to a couple. I want to talk about a couple of conditions that kind of made the guidelines and, and maybe our listeners are not quite as in tune to. I'll, I'll start with um, this idea about iron deficiency uh, treatment. Um, and maybe I'll turn it over to Orly, kind of uh, summarize, you know, why, why is that now in the guidelines and, and what are we recommending uh, practitioners sh should do? Sure. So I think we have come to recognize that um, iron deficiency is important in heart failure because it can affect exercise capacity and quality of life. And uh, in the presence or absence of uh, anemia, so iron deficiency in itself is something that should be identified as part of baseline assessment of heart failure. And if it is identified, then it should be treated. Um, so there have been controversies um, over the years on how to treat iron deficiency. And sometimes people think oral iron and 
Um, we've come to learn that oral iron is just not very well absorbed. So intravenous iron does um, a much better job at repleting iron stores uh, and has evidence in terms of uh, improved exercise capacity, quality of life, six minute walk test, so functional improvement um, in the setting of heart failure. Uh, and in addition, uh, some reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So it is a 2A recommendation to replete with uh, intravenous formulation of iron. Yeah, what did I miss? No, that's, that's, that was great. I suspect a lot of our listeners are not going to be comfortable or used to doing this. And it really is, is, is a change in practice for many, many people. Uh, anyone want to add in any other comments around iron deficiency? I think something I'll add really quickly is that treatment um, or repletion of iron shouldn't, of course, surplant any other GDMT that we, we can do this alongside, but not instead of, it's in addition to. Excellent. Uh, the second condition was amyloid heart disease, another hot topic, just like cardiogenic shock. And a lot of attention in the guidelines, a beautiful figure uh, presented there uh, about treatment, uh, diagnostic algorithm. Uh, as, as well as treatment. Um, Paul, uh, maybe, maybe you'll kind of give us a sense of, of, you know, why so much attention now to amyloid and kind of high level message for the listeners. Yeah, so I think it mainly stemmed from uh, the trial showing that we have treatment that clearly improves outcome and survival to famitis for those with, with transthyretin. Um, so then I think the guideline then sort of worked back from there, then how do we identify those patients? And what should we do first? So our, we did come up with um, four main class, uh, main recommendations. One is to first look for the light chains because they will have a different treatment. Um, then if you're at that point still suspecting a transthyretin that we do a technetium pyrophosphate scan. Um, and then if abnormal, um, we do TTR gene sequencing primarily to help um, understand um, if it's hereditary and, and there, cause there may be then implications for family members. Regardless though, um, those with um, an abnormal scan um, for those with class one to three symptoms would have a recommendation for treatment. Again, it all comes from having that uh, drug for the first time uh, that clearly improves outcome in this population. Yeah, thank you. And, and for, for the listeners who may think this is esoteric, remember, uh, you know, some estimates are the 10% of patients with HFEF may in fact have amyloid. So certainly something that we all need to pay attention to. Um, before we get to the questions, again, some great questions here. I, I did want to bring up one more topic uh, from the panel and I'm going to go back to Paul here. Um, value statements are now included in the guidelines. Um, you know, maybe the listeners uh, could benefit from just, you know, why are they in there? How do, how do we use these? Um, kind of some overview comments around those. Sure, so the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association felt it was uh, time to start adding these whenever we have high quality published data. So we weren't going to commission our own analyses, but if there were published data for this particular treatment or diagnostic strategy, we would have uh, experts on the committee and we had those who could review these and uh, classify them uh, per pre-specified criteria as either a very a low value or a high value um, or intermediate value um, based on some standard criteria on how much it costs per how much life expectancy we gain or quality adjusted life expectancy we gain. And we're fortunate in a heart failure, I think, to have a large number of studies like this done for most of our therapies. And the other good news is that most of our therapy, the vast majority of our therapy is very high value. Um, and um, so um, I think heart failure, be, part of that is because the, a lot of the medications are now generic, um, but the benefits are often so good that, the, that they are very high value. So I think that's one of the fortunate things about heart failure care uh, that is often is not appreciated compared to other areas of medicine. And do you anticipate clinicians using this in any way, or is this more for payers? Or That's a good point. It, it is targeted at payers, policymakers, uh, in, industry itself, suggesting, you know, get trying to say what we think as societies think that would be, a, you know, whether this is considered low or high value based on how it's priced. Um, however, I, while I don't uh, personally recommend physicians-based treatment decisions directly on the value, I think it's important for us to be aware of the value 
Um, we also in our, you know, may want to advocate for improving the value of therapy by lowering prices. And, uh, and so again, not necessarily for the physician themselves, although I think it is important for the physicians to be aware. Yeah, that's great. And, and thank you. I mean, our listeners to hear that from you, that, that's just awesome information. Thank you. But let's go to these questions. And we're going to go back first to this idea about implementation science at ACC. The Yale group led by uh, Tarek Ahmad uh, reported their uh, primary results from Prompt HF, which was a EHR-based alert system and showed that they were able to move the needle, that is, increase uh, GDMT implementation. I think it was by moving up at least one class was added. And it was a significant benefit and rapid enrollment of over, I think, a thousand patients in about seven months from what I recall, you know, really provocative uh, uh, trial and, and maybe pointing the way forward. So um, interested in people's thoughts uh, around that. Rob, maybe I know you and Dr. Ahmed have uh, gone way back. What, what are your thoughts about that? Sure, so I mean, I would start by congratulating Tarek and colleagues. I mean, this is such an important uh, study that they conducted efficiently, as you noted, and showed improved strategies to actually get folks on the medications they need. So congrats to his team. And I think what it's showing is that the status quo is insufficient. We need nudges. We need data-driven approaches to help improve the care for our patients. And so I think these are the exact type of studies at a health system that can then be hopefully expanded to, to other sites as well to show benefits for our patients. Yeah, and in the guidelines themselves, I believe there was uh, areas for future research. Uh, uh, and this would be one of those examples. Beacom, you have any comments around that? I think the alert system is a very interesting concept. If done right, in a which they did, which I mean, Tarek's group did a phenomenal job in coming up with one of the smart ways, not overburdening, overloading with information, and making the alerts actually disappear at times, and then the follow-ups being rather frequent in a single um, site um, was beautiful. Uh, there has been in the former AHA uh, studies demonstrating uh, no difference when the alerts are very indiscriminate. So the concept is um, perhaps smart, actionable EHR systems that are able to walk the clinician in implementation rather than a blasting uh, alert system works. So I think those kind of concepts we need to be cognizant of uh, because there is information overload and there is probably alert fatigue. And if done right, as was the case uh, in Prompt HF, um, and if done in an actionable actions being uh, paired with the alerts um, at the right timing, it works. Yeah, certainly alert fatigue is a concern, but if I recall correctly, uh, they had data on what the clinicians viewed the alerts and, and, and many of them found it to be useful, if I recall correctly. Um, any other comments from the panelists? Yeah, I'll just say one quick thing. I think it's really neat to see oh, on the heels of our conversation already, these trials that are now also focused on implementation. Right, we have to keep discovery of science going. It's super exciting to be in our field right now. It's, it's wonderful to see newer and newer meds, but a lot of the questions even that we're seeing in the chat and otherwise is okay, as Beacom said, we have to expect, uh, really almost demand and ensure multiple drugs on board for our patients with heart failure. But then it comes like, okay, well, all right, we're at quadruple therapy. Now what? Are we going to add Verisigwad? Are we adding hydralazine in certain cases? Where do we go? Where do we stop? Um, so I love the fact that we're focusing now on how strategies to improve implementation, whether it's through EHR, whether it's through, you know, even like Diamond HF with the use of potassium binders to allow for more MRA use. So I think we're in this new exciting maybe i'm drinking the heart failure kool-aid here but <laughs> but uh i mean i think it's really exciting alongside scientific discovery we're now focusing on being innovative um in terms of implementation strategies so i think I, i'm looking forward to more work in this space thank, thank you that's great let's let's pivot now and go back there's a couple of questions around the concept of quadruple therapy that that we should get through the first is um is this a class effect with the slt2 inhibitors we have empagliflozin and empagliflozin and we have Combined SGLT one and two. Um, is this a class effect? Uh, recommendations from the panelists. Or really, maybe I'll, I'll let you start there. Sure. I think there um, is certainly evidence to suggest that there are benefits across the class uh, in terms of cardiovascular benefits. 
there are um, certainly differences between um, focusing on S1 versus S2. Um, however, I think in general, what we should do is stick with what um, has been published and shown to improve benefits um, in heart failure, whether it's HEFREF, HEFPEF, are uh, mildly reduced with the agents, uh, embagliflozin and dabagliflozin. Certainly, sotagliflozin is interesting with, in the um, acute heart failure setting, and we know now that we can start these agents safely um, from impulse. We know that this can be done. Um, so my long-winded answer is, yes, there appears to be a benefit across the class um, for, for heart failure, but with some minor tweaks. That's great. Let, let's take a quick poll. We'll go down people. Uh, you, m most of us, it's between empagliflozin and empagliflozin. And we're seeing a patient going to start someone. Uh, any preference uh, between those two, Rob? Uh, so good question. I would say our usual approach, and I've seen varied ones, is the cost can differ for different patients. I've seen uh, important shared decision-making conversations with patients. I've even seen prescribing of both and then saying to the patient, pick up the one that is cheaper for you. Uh, but as Orly nicely shared, you know, I think the data, it, it can be a little bit confusing uh, for, for different folks, it, given some of the differences in the trials, the endpoints. So I think really the guidelines did a nice job about bringing the data together, presenting it in a way that is consistent and clear for practicing clinicians to help improve uptake. Yeah, does anyone feel differently? Uh, I'm getting a sense, uh, class effect, it sounds like so far. Uh, it sounds like the panelists is doing that. The second uh, 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 question about quadruple therapy, which is even stickier, is uh, the order. How do we get, uh, we talked about getting now, you know, four classes on. Um, let's say it's new onset heart failure. Uh, approaches about, about around that. How do we, uh, is it sequential? Do you get them all on at low doses, rapid up titration? Um, you know, clearly getting into the gray area, not, not fully delineated in the guidelines uh, where we kind of said, get them onto all four. Um, Paul, you wanna, you wanna uh, weigh in at first? Sure, yeah, I'll just reiterate that, right. The, we, the guideline committee felt there was not enough data to make a recommendation. So again, this would all be personal preference. I um, would probably move an SGLT2 inhibitor up early, if not first uh, myself for, um, you know, just because I think it does make it easier to use and some of the RAS inhibitors are an MRA. Um, so I'll stop there, let we can go around the room. Yeah, uh, Beacon, what do you think? I think there is not a one or two recipe. Uh, there is many different permutations on how one can optimize as long as one optimizes. Uh, how to initiate and sequence, I think, uh, would depend on etiology, patient presentation, hemodynamics, phenotypes. For example, in a post-MI patient uh, with you know, ongoing ischemia, uh, yes, beta blockers start first. In an individual who's coming congested after decongesting with diuretics, one will initiate agents such as, for example, uh, entities that you know are gonna be helpful uh, both with the um, volume status and the congestion along with the kidney, and thus HGLT2 inhibitors um, uh, play a role. Um, NYHA classifications, as um, we uh, specified in our recommendations, have unique um, indications. For example, ARNI for NYHA class 2 to 3, uh, the others for the whole class 2 to 4, um, in the aftermath of the LIFE HF trial, um, not seeing any benefit with ARNI in that very advanced heart failure population, and also not having um, enough representation in the paradigm trial with NYHA class patients, less than 1% of the patients in that trial were um, NYJ class four, we didn't feel there was enough ed evidence to recommend ARNI in NYJ class four patients. And thus one needs to, I think, individualize um, and uh, look at the patient's hemody hemodynamic status, blood pressure, and ability to tolerate. I tend to increase and try to achieve the four classes within four to six weeks. Would I do all four at the same time? Maybe um, in an individual with a permissible blood pressure and possibly in an outpatient setting, I may. In the inpatient setting, sometimes there had been situations where we have been able to initiate four, but not all four pills at the same time. We uh, spread them apart and add small doses. And usually with the 
indications that helps us. Um, you know, MRA in that context may be helping with the congestion concepts as well as morbidity, mortality outcome, SGLT2 the same. Uh, so I think overall individualized is my answer. Yeah. Can I add something really Please. quick to, um, to push this panel on? This is a question that I think we're, we're gonna get a lot um, is that now that there are four, which, um, how, which one do you prioritize the dose for? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Well, SGLT2s are one dose, right? So, and the MRA is only two steps and sometimes limited by the, um, the EGFR and or the potassium. So the beta blockade dose and ARNI dose, beta blockade dose is usually optimized um, if you're able to, if they are hemodynamically stable, actually you optimize very quickly if the heart rate requires it, right? It's AFib RVR, tachycardia, or the tachycardia is causing the, um, perhaps the worsening of the heart failure versus really volume overloaded, you're not really starting a very large dose beta blockade until you decongest. Um, in terms of um, ACE inhibitors and or ARNI in the blood pressure is a sort of a um, art by which I practice. I sometimes start, um, you know, ACE inhibitors in a very sick patient that is borderline, you know, blood pressure, maybe with captopril with small doses. Uh, optimize. And if that individual has um, a good blood pressure as an outpatient, I switch, or sometimes I start ARB and add the ARNI. But I think these are all uh, concepts that we individualize. Yeah, so, so I need more data. And I think this idea about spend function and you have so much blood pressure and how do you spend it on blood pressure versus RAS blockers is really intriguing. Um, well, it's hard to believe, but our time has flown by here. I want to thank the participants. I mean, what, a, what an also our team. Thank you. I also want to thank the HFSA for hosting this. Sorry, we didn't get to all the questions. I do want to remind everyone that this has been recorded and will be available at a later date. Um, and also, of course, go to the uh, HFSA uh, website and you can find the uh, guidelines themselves there. So again, I want to thank uh, Paul, Beacom, Rob, Anu, and Orly uh, for their wonderful uh, comments today. And with that, we will adjourn. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. you.